Joyce. Joyce, I think you're muted. I can't hear you. Now I hear you. Oh, good. I guess that's good. <laughs> well, we'll need you. I don't know how many people will join us tonight. Hopefully, be nice. yeah. I'm lucky to get you like so. Um, well, You can only put it out there. That's all. See how many show up. <sighs> how long do you think your review of the um, referrals from the ordinance committee will take on on uh, Thursday? I would think that the manufactured home one probably won't take too long. I think I would imagine probably that uh, ECB doesn't have um, too many comments on it. There's not much to it. Yeah. The off street parking one. Hey, Steve. Yeah. The off street parking one might be a little bit more substantial. It's certainly a lot larger. It definitely mm -hmm. has positive environmental benefits, but I don't know how yeah. long it comes. So are you looking for if, because um, we've got, you know, a few other things uh, to do here too. Um, are you thinking that this would be the last chance we're going to get, or do you think we're going to be able to? You would get another. Um, this is before you give it to town, before you give it to town board or to back to the ordinance committee. This will likely be the last time before the town board sets a public hearing on it. Okay. Unless you guys have real substantial comments, or you or the planning board, zoning board have the real substantial comments that necessitate like a larger rewrite. Okay. <clears throat> Steve, I think you're muted. Hello, hello. Now we got you. There you go. I have my wife's name on here. I'm not sure. <laughs> Millie Reynolds. <laughs> <laughs> it looks like it's uh muting when everybody joins. Everybody, okay. yeah. Are you did um you can do that, can't you, as host? Um, I can unmute some people. No, but I mean, but you can mute us all. Yeah, I can mute everybody. Um, but if people mute themselves, I can't unmute them. Yeah. They have to do it. Kathy, how are you doing? I'm good. How are you? All right. All right. So
Nice to see everybody today. We'll give everybody else a couple more minutes before opening up. Hopefully we'll have a few more people join us. Steve, how have you been? You got a short year with Victor? Yeah, boy, I haven't worked since uh, March. Um, well, I did uh, uh, deliver food to some of the people in the, in the district. So, But that was just for a couple hours a day, maybe yeah. four times a month, you know. Do you know what the plan is then for next year? I haven't really followed. I had to uh, sign a, <clears throat> uh, well, I didn't sign it, but I had to take a survey yesterday where they said that the uh, high school kids were going to go in uh, two days a week, uh, like Monday, Wednesday, I think Monday, Thursday, Tuesday, Friday, and then each of them alternating Wednesdays. Um, and then uh, the elementary kids uh, came through six are, are um, doing about the same thing. And then other things like they can only put 25 people on my bus and um, things of that nature. Okay. Tim, glad to have you back. First time I've seen you in a while. Yeah, it's it's good good to be back, and it has been a while. How was I'm, your uh, end of last year at Morrisville? Yeah, uh, last year was last year was went went all right, I thought, except for you know the coronavirus sure did uh, sure did interrupt a lot of things. Yeah. Well, hopefully you're able to get everything done. Yeah, we had you know, part of the semester online, you know, last semester, so we, we managed as so. And, uh, All right. Well, um, actually, there's one more person joining us, Bill Lee. Yeah. He's on the call. We'll get started here and go over kind of what our goal is for the evening and uh, then jump right into it. Bill, are you there? Can you hear us? He looks like you're muted too, Bill. There you are. Yeah, I can hear you. Cool. All right. Uh, if anybody else joins us, we'll let them in. As you guys could tell, we have a little waiting room working on when people do join us. Um, I was going to ask for introductions and stuff like that, but I think everybody uh, knows everybody here. There's no need to waste anybody's time tonight. We have quite a bit to cover. Um, so we'll do a, a quick recap of where we are, how we got here. Um, this process started uh, generally at the beginning of last year in 2019. Uh, we formed this project team, I believe it was in May of last year. Uh, we've had a number of public meetings in August of last year, along with a public survey that I think was also uh, produced in August and went until November, which we got quite a few responses. I can't remember the top, off the top of my head. Um, with those responses, we put together a uh, draft, sorry, a draft vision statement for uh, the town moving forward and I'm sharing my screen now with everybody so you should be able to see um, over here the 2011 vision statement from the 2011 comprehensive plan and our draft vision statement for 2020 which I'll just read real quickly. The town of Canada will maintain its character and beauty through protection and enhancement of its natural, agricultural, rural, historic and recreational resources. We encourage opportunities for balanced growth economic development, and cultural events that create a welcoming environment for a diversity of residents, visitors, and businesses. 
The town will work with stakeholders to protect Canandaigua Lake, the quality of life, and provide high quality community services. So as we work forward with our goals, um, action items, measurables, that vision should kind of keep, keep in our mind because uh, that's really what we're going for. Um, that vision has been through a number of different iterations and the CIC has provided comments a couple of times. Um, and then at our meetings earlier this year, uh, we did start doing this. We went through uh, goals one through six, so generally it's agricultural, agriculture, natural environment, uh, cultural historic resources, parks and recreation, uh, economic development, and residential and neighborhood character. Uh, where we left off was, as you can imagine, number seven, hamlets. And that's kind of where we're going to pick up today. Um, we're going to go through each goal. Um, we are going to identify different measurables. Um, so how will we, 10 years from now, or between five to 10 years when we update this conference plan, how might we uh, measure our success? Um, just as an example from our previous meeting uh, for like residential and neighborhood character, uh, one measurable might be population growth, uh, demographic changes. Uh, these are just generally objective things. We can measure them and we can see what's changed from time to time. Um, and then beyond the measurables, uh, we've, we would identify action steps. These are specific items that we can undertake or the town can undertake um, to achieve that goal and potentially as measured by our measurable items. So, again, we're going to begin with Hamlets here tonight. Um, we are, so I'm not sure if we'll be able to get through all of them tonight. There's quite a few at the last meetings. We were only able to get through three at a time. But we'll try to you know, keep it under 20, 25 minutes per each goal, which would give us enough time to get through it tonight. Um, we're just trying to get uh, items on the board right now, and I'll kind of keep track of the comments as well as this meeting being recorded so I can get them after the fact. Um, so it's not so important to have you know long, drawn-out discussions upon each action item or measurable. We just kind of want to get people's ideas and then uh, there will be something of a filtering process later. Um, if you're not speaking, try to mute yourself. Um, if you do have something that you want to add, uh, please feel free to unmute yourself and speak. Just, you know, obviously be considerate of other people. Try not to talk over everybody. It's tough to work on Zoom and get it to function appropriately. If you also want to raise your hand in the app or, you know, on the video, feel free to do that too. And uh, we'll try to do it in an orderly fashion. Um, so I tried to just put some of these uh, on the board here. Uh, can everybody read what I have up and sharing on the screen? Yeah? Okay. So uh, for goal seven are hamlets, which, sorry, again, our goal is to uh, structure land use regulations, design standards, and zoning code to improve and protect town hamlets and gateways especially the hamlet of Cheshire. Um, so the town has a number of hamlets, but generally speaking, it's Cheshire, which is the biggest one, um, Centerfield, which is on 5 and 20 in McCann Road at the intersection there. Um, there were a number of historic hamlets. Uh, there's McMillan's Corners, which was at the corner of Cooley Road and County Road 30. Uh, there's Paddleford on County Road 8. Um, and then we also have a couple gateways that the town has previously established. There's like the MU02 area at the intersection of 332 and uh, Canandaigua Farmington Town Line Road. There is the Uptown area, uh, which is again a kind of on 332 in between Brickyard and uh, what would that be? Like Emerson. Well, Emerson wraps around the fire hall. And then the other MU area which is the State Route 364, Otisiana Point down there, you, Steve, running from uh, the town of Gorham, which actually runs all the way up north to uh, State Route 21 north. So that's, those are the kind of areas that we're looking at here. 
Um, and with that goal in mind, we, we obviously want to protect these areas and make them better. Um, so for you guys, uh, to answer to me, I guess, uh, what sorts of measurables would we have to uh, review later on the success of our goals and action actions in this plan? How will we how will we say we've been successful in protecting or enhancing town hamlets? Um, I put a couple on here that you can disagree with and let me know. Uh, but permits issued, sometimes it's going to be related to uh, the renovation of a hamlet area, whether it's like permits for construction of a new commercial space or renovation of a commercial space. Um, if we can measure the residents of a space, that's kind of an indicator for a health of an area if people still want to live there. Uh, total assessed valuation, you know, if an area is in decline, its assessed valuation may go down, or also a, a value per acre. So you have a, let's say, a specific area, the acres of the land, uh, how valuable is that? It's kind of a general measure, measuring term. Um, what are your thoughts? Yeah, go ahead, Kathy. Um, it's probably part of what you're saying in terms of commercial spaces, residents, but number of vacant buildings as part of that. Okay. Yeah, definitely. That would help measure the health of an area. Um, yeah, George. We've, um, you know, we've been through this for years now, but it's about infrastructure and sewer coming into the hamlet. Um, I guess we could measure some success of our action items if we, if, um, you know, if sewer eventually does or when it comes to the hamlet, because without sewer, you, you know, you can kind of envision what you'd like, but the realities of it there's not going to be much development, economic development there, um, unless it only be a certain kind of very small business without that infrastructure. So it's, I'm thinking of that. So if you don't have the infrastructure, you are very limited in the kinds of things that are going to happen um, in, yep. in, as far as economic development. Karen, go ahead. Uh, you are muted, though. I think I, I agree with what Joyce is saying, but I think before you can do anything, and with the exception of the Hamlet of Cheshire, which is clearly defined, none of the other hamlets are clearly defined. Uh, Center, even Centerfield, which is known as Centerfield, isn't clearly defined. Um, and I, I, I think that is the number one thing that has to be done, is clearly define what these hamlets are. Some might not, might turn out to not be a hamlet. Uh, yeah. Because I, it, I, seems to, it seems to me a hamlet is a cohesive um, community. And I mean, I could almost say Laura Lane is a hamlet because it's a community. And, uh, you know, it doesn't have sidewalks, but it's got gutters on its street, it's got sewers, it's got uh, the infrastructure for a hamlet. Cheshire is the only one that has a definition to it. It, it has a, um, uh, a business district, so to speak. It, it has a clear center, it has a church, it has a fire department, it, it has all the elements that I would look for in a hamlet. It has a park. Um, I, I think we really need to define because I think some of the things, like places you've mentioned, might not be a hamlet. Uh, I highlighted it on the screen that I'm sharing with you guys. I I recommend that as an action item, and certainly it was an example I was going to put up. I think that that is an important element. Even within Cheshire, there's really no there's no boundary, so to speak. So, you know, if you're, as you get into measurables, especially, you know, yeah, there's no you want to measure success in a hamlet, you know, what, what is the definition and boundary of that hamlet? So, yeah, that's definitely a good and probably the first action item under this goal category. 
but Eric, it has to have more than the boundary. It, it has to have um, the elements that make it a Hamlet. Uh, you know, and, and we need to determine what the, those elements, what we would like to see in a Hamlet, but there are certain elements that a Hamlet has that you need it when you make the boundary of it. I don't quite know how to express that, but that's the way I see it. Um, Sarah, did you want to add? Yeah, I, I feel like we had this conversation before and I thought someone said that maybe the state defines it or has a definition of what a Hamlet is. I might be wrong, but I feel like we had, we talked about think, this before. I think there is a state, there is a state definition. I guess my question also would be, do we want to limit it to Hamlets or are we trying to also create spaces within that may not fit the definition of Hamlets. We want to create areas that people might want to consider a neighborhood community or something like that. And I'm not sure where we're going with things like um, Paddleford or Centerfield. So I agree. I think we have to maybe not use that term Hamlet or expand it to include other things. If that's what you're going for. Maybe. Joyce. I think something? one of the measurables could be its designation. I'm talking about Cheshire Hamlet now, not and maybe the other ones too, um, a historic district. Um, once, if, and when, uh, I, I presumes we have a boundary, um, it, it is very possible that we could be, you know, nominated as a historic district, whatever that process is. I know that's a state and federal process probably, but um that um in creating that historic district or some kind of historic designation for those other smaller entities that maybe aren't don't qualify as a hamlet but certainly have historic elements to them that we would want to preserve um you know that might be something we want to consider and yeah and I, all I threw that over I just wanted to say, it. I, as you can tell, I threw it over in the action item list. Yeah. It seemed more like an action item than a measurable. It's true. Um, getting back to Kathy's comment about, I guess, whether we use the term Hamlet or we use a more broad term to describe what we're going for, it might be better to include it in this goal category because, of course, we have town hamlets and gateways. I don't really think that those – those areas that we're trying to, you know, get at and define here are gateways, and I'm not sure that they're, you know, defined as hamlets either. So whether it's like a, you know, our previous goal was sort of like neighborhood character of these. Well, just to uh, well, correct I, myself, Eric, hamlets are not actually defined under New York State law. I just looked it up, so I'm okay. shocked by that, but that's the case, so. Yeah, well, they're, I mean, they're, yeah pretty much informal agglomerations of people, right? And they don't, they lack a governing jurisdiction. So they kind of just exist mostly. But whether it's like there's services provided there, a lot of them formed originally around a post office or churches, um, you know, they're something like that. But um, getting back to uh, measurables anyways, uh, before we move on to some more specific action items, which it sounds like you guys have, are there any other measurables that you can think of to um, check this in the future? And if not, you know, we can move. Um, we can move to the action steps if nobody has anything more here. Nothing. Okay. Well, then hopefully we'll have some more in the uh, action items category then. So um, same with measurables. I put up some uh, of my suggested action items um, and feel free to kind of change, correct, guide me where you think I'm off base. Uh, I thought it would be appropriate to have Hamlet zoning districts, especially in the Hamlet of Cheshire, 
um, a lot of those zoning to, or the zoning that we have down there, and Gary knows that I've harped on this before, uh, the neighborhood commercial zoning district and especially its setback requirements really doesn't match what's out there today. Same with the uh, R130 category, which is what it's zoned today. It really could use an update to match uh, what's there because we actually like it. So we should try to create rules that promote and legalize what's there. Um, so it, it seems appropriate to me that there should be a Hamlet zoning district, certainly for Cheshire. Um, as I said before, it would be good to have a Hamlet boundary and definition so that we kind of know what we're dealing with in these areas. Uh, you could probably also add a gateway, although I think that we have a more defined boundary there. Um, as you all are aware, the Cheshire has a master plan dating back from 2004, I think it was. Mm -hmm. uh, it could probably use an update. And I think that, um, sorry, <laughs> I think that you could probably use an update. And I know yeah, that I, that it, I just had an opportunity to go through that um, that master plan just in the last few days, and there's are, are some things like um, the the meeting house is now on historic uh, designated um, national, um, whatever you call that thing. And there were some other errors in there. I mean, not errors. Well, there are errors now, but I mean, things that have uh, occurred in the or goals um, developed in that master plan that have been achieved. So, you know, it's time to move on and see what more we can do with that master plan. Yep. And just for the sake of time, you know, it's been 15 years or so. It, it, you update our master plan every five to 10 years. It's almost expired at this point. Um, there, I put in a note there for sidewalks and pedestrian infrastructure. It's something that, especially in our Cheshire meeting, we heard a lot about. And if you've walked, it does get a, a quite a bit of foot traffic down there in Cheshire. Um, and those sidewalks aren't in great repair, not to mention there's not really crosswalks down there either. So investing in some potential pedestrian infrastructure that helps create that uh, cohesion for a residential space, people kind of walking back and forth between the neighborhood. Uh, I thought that would be a good opportunity. Same with any hamlet or gateway, really. Um, what, do you, what do you guys have? I don't want to control the conversation here. And, you know, think about Cheshire, think about Centerfield, uh, think about those three MUO areas. What do we need to do to uh, improve or enhance them. Go ahead, Karen. All right. I I can think about Cheshire and I can view Cheshire as a hamlet. Um, Cheshire, if, if you read what uh, Sarah sent around, and I had already read it on my phone, um, a hamlet is pretty much defined as an unincorporated area without any clear boundaries. However, what Cheshire has that some of the others do not have is a speed limit and the ability to add infrastructure and such as sidewalks, which I don't think any of us sitting here would want to see sidewalks on um, Route 5 and 20 with the Centerfield uh, intersection because <laughs> I, I, there they would not be, there would be safety issues. So I think we should go clear, go through what what you are looking at as um, ham, a hamlet or a gateway, and apply apply some of the things that we see in Cheshire or in the uptown gateway or um, you know whatever else, and and see if, if they if they all have some commonality basically, because if, I don't believe you can, you can just say hamlets. It's like saying the entire state of New York could be a bunch of hamlets, and they're not really. You know, there, there are other areas. The uptown area is the town of Canandaigua. It's a gateway to a, um, something we envision, but it's not yet. 
so and that one I'm fine with, but the Paddleford Road, um, uh, the um, Kendigua Farmington Town Line. I mean, those. I I don't see how you can define those as a hamlet or even a gate a gateway. I I think we need to narrow it down. As bottom line is what I'm saying to just a few areas for the, for this update this master plan update otherwise we could take every area in town and uh and, and say it's a hamlet the morale development that's behind my house easily could qualify as a as a hamlet because it does pretty much have the infrastructure you're talking about it does have the community spirit it it does have a speed limit it does have um not a real boundary, but somewhat of a boundary. You see what I'm saying? We're, we're saying that's say a hamlet, but it could be a development, it could be something else. I think we, it, it all goes back to definition, but I think we can eliminate some of the other areas that are not, uh, in my opinion, clearly are not a hamlet or even could be thought of as a hamlet. Yeah, Joyce. Um. I just recently reviewed the comp plan update from 2011, and I think it might be helpful for us to review um, exactly what uh, they've listed and identified as, um, as cultural and historic listings. They have a very detailed listing of all of the kinds of things we're talking about, Paddleford and all these different historic and cultural um, kind of, of, you know, areas, uh, but maybe we should go back and see what they called, why they've listed all of these historic, what, what made them, you know, so important that they put them in this document. Um, you can see there's, okay, it, it explains kind of historically what they were and is that the definition then of a hamlet? Maybe it's about history too, not just boundaries and gateways, but maybe it's about history. I don't, I don't know. I'm just, I'm just throwing this out. I'm just saying that there, in that document, there is a listing, a very lengthy listing. Didn't even get into the open space manual and it didn't certainly get into the comprehensive plan original one in 2003. So um, just yeah. thinking you might be helpful for us. Um, just for kind of the sake of time, um, Karen mentioned, well, limiting our discussion to note that, you know, our action items relate to, I guess, these specific areas and not making it overly broad to places that A, don't exist yet, or B, you know, aren't to most people recognized as a hamlet. Um, so when we're talking about this for the sake of the comp plan, are we in agreement that the Cheshire, Cheshire is one of them and Uptown is one of them? Um, I believe that the 364 area and uh, the one on Canada Farmington Town Line Road, although they are certainly raw, have been identified by the town in previous comp plans and documents as gateways and probably should be translated over. Um, as this goal relates not to what necessarily is there today, but also what the town envisions into the future, I think there's appropriate information to say that the town has done that in the past. And you know, I don't think that this comp plan has led us to believe that that's gonna be severed in any way. Um, as far as Centerfield, I, I would still maintain that you know the area can be changed which I don't think anyone would disagree with, but we can leave that off, that's fine. Uh, as Cheshire is kind of the only existing remaining Hamlet. Uh, does, does everybody in front of, or with us tonight kind of agree with that, that we can leave it to those four areas? Well, if you look at the open space uh, master plan and if you look at the maps on cultural and historic, uh, Centerfield is denominated as a hamlet. So, uh, you know, we're, we're running into what's happening in other policy manuals now and what do we want to capture and what, how we want to put that all together. I think it might be, uh, maybe look at map 12. Oh yeah, there it is. 
Now you can see you can see that the hem the that Centerfield is identified there, and Cheshire as the historic hamlets of the town, and they're just those two. That's all, according to the research that was done when we developed the you know when the open space master plan was developed. So that could eliminate. I mean, if we take this information and incorporate it into what we're thinking, then we've only got two hamlets and we can deal with them instead of going into all those others uh, that you mentioned. Steve, what do you think? Well, I, I was, you know, thinking of 364 down here where I'm at and um, people think of themselves as whatever the, uh, the beach area is, if it's sandy, Cove or if it's uh, um, Fallbrook or if it's Tishiana Point or whatever. Um, so, so they think of themselves, but they don't, they don't think about people on the other side of the street, you know. Um, so there's, there's really that, not that cohesion that, uh, that Karen was talking about, you know. And, um, is, there, is there any reason why they should try to, to obtain uh, Hamlet's uh, uh, status is there is there some something they would gain from from that i don't think there's any real status necessarily to be gained other than you know people in cheshire i'm not sure about centerfield but certainly in cheshire you know identify with that community yeah yeah which is great mm -hmm. yeah um so to joyce's question anyways as far as including centerfield uh, you know, it's certainly in this document. It's been in past documents for the town. Uh, does everybody agree with this? I personally, I do. Um, it really only adds one more item to our list. So. Uh, what about you, Tim? You got an opinion on this one? Well, uh, I, I think there's a lot of a lot of good points brought up. I think think de definitely Cheshire could could have some neat things for it going in the future. Uh, but as for like Centerfield goes and in, in, uh, in what we were discussing there, um, I, I guess I can see why some people would consider it a hamlet and why some people wouldn't. Uh, but I guess. I don't know. I guess I don't really have, I guess, much more of a comment at this time, but I thought some good points were brought up. Okay. Well, um, just to kind of keep us moving here, we've been on this one for 20 minutes or so. Are there any other action items that you guys foresee uh, or that would like to see happen to protect or improve our hamlets and or gateway areas? Um, I would think that maybe an appropriate one was the continue implementation of the uptown plan. Yeah, and, Okay, I just, this is just one little thing and I, th I think it would help us. If these five particular areas were identified. And I, I mean, they're identified in our minds, but I can bet that half of this, the community of the town of Canandaigua has no clue what we're talking about. And this would go along with signage. Perhaps we should have signage here. This is, this is a historic hamlet of Centerfield. We know that Cheshire is historic, um, and and the other gateways. This this is the uptown, uh, the gateway to to uh, an up the uptown, whatever. And I I think signage would be immeasurable. You know, if we had that, that we would have we actually have made these these uh, we have identified these areas. Right now they're not identified in my opinion, other than I understand, I see where Joyce uh, on the map, I do see that. But you know, the others might have historic um, things behind their names too. And I don't really know that. I've only lived in Canandaigua for 48 years. So um, <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not old enough to know that, but uh, just by 
identifying them for the public might be an interesting thing to have and a measurable. I think that goes hand in hand with uh, the historic values of these is one of the implementation goals of the comprehensive update was to establish uh, tourism for, um, you know, historic district tours and things like that. So that's also a part, I think, of all of this, the signage piece and everything. Now, and remember that the CIC has a signage committee. So there's really an opportunity here for us to communicate to the signage committee what we think the information on a sign would be for, you know, a hamlet or other or some of the other gateways. So it's not just about what we're doing here. It's it's about how we can communicate with other committees about what our thoughts are. Too. That's just some side. Sarah, did you want to add something? Yeah, I just was, before Karen said it, that's exactly what I was thinking is that signage, but not just signage, you know, you are in Cheshire or you're in Centerfield. Yeah. Since this yeah. goal talks about the gateway areas, it does link back to that signage committee because in the gateway areas, we need welcome to the town of Canandaigua. So just to make sure we're all on the same page, not just identifying the hamlet, but in the gateway areas, it would be the bigger welcome to the town signs. But yeah, that's all I was going to say. Yes, Steve. Um, what I wanted to say about Paddleford is I think it, it, it involved the railroad and, and the railroad, of course, doesn't doesn't go there anymore. Is, is there something like that for uh, for Centerfield? Was there, was there some reason that it was a hamlet? Uh, 100 years ago? I think it was, there was a post office there at one point was part of it. Um, I think they had a cheese factory there at one point and, you know, some other small um, kind of agricultural related businesses. Yeah. Um, okay. Then uh, we'll move on from this one because we, we did spend a bit of time. Our next one uh, relates to transportation. Um, so our goal here is the goal of the town to facilitate a diversified transportation system that effectively serves motorists, bicyclists, pedestrians, transit users, and farm equipment. Future transportation development should accommodate active alternative transportation and be designed to maximize, sa maximize safety for all modes of travel. Transportation infrastructure should incorporate changing technologies such as electric vehicles and autonomous vehicles. Give you a minute to digest it. And whenever you're ready, let me know what sorts of measurables you have in mind here. Go ahead. We have, we have plug in stations throughout the town. <laughs> <laughs> Miles of trails. There you go. Or I also want to add sidewalk and yeah. bike. Yeah. Yeah. Um, since part of the goal relates to safety about uh, accident information. Yeah, I, I, I definitely like, like the part about uh, road safety when it comes to agricultural equipment. I, I'm, a, yeah. I'm a big advocate for safety in that aspect. Uh, I guess yep. one, one comment I could make. I remember I think it was your father at the meeting at your guys' farm that made a big point about that. And I think that's why that ended up getting in there. Um, you know, we well, have those those farm friendly signs mm -hmm. um, yeah. with the tractor and everything. I wonder if um, um, there could be some I don't know, additional information, you know, a little sign below it, watch for tractors or tractors are, you know, part of our road or I don't know how, you know, 
you know how you have these signs that say bike friendly or whatever so that motorists know that bicycles also are traveling on the roads maybe there's or an addition to the signage around where the far those um, farm friendly signs are. Yeah, I, I, I like that point. Um, I, I I definitely would, would want motorists to, to be safe when they're driving down the road because I can definitely vouch coming from the, the, the farmer's perspective when uh, sometimes we have to travel to fields where we travel through a couple of high traffic areas um, and it could, it could be it could be a little bit sporty trying to trying to get through a few intersections because yeah. uh, so some motorists are are great and, and are safe and and uh, you know they'll wave to you and, and all of that jazz and some of them just don't yeah. care so <laughs> do you do you have things. any suggestions for uh, action items as it might relate to farm vehicle safety? Items. Well, um, I guess one. I guess just one of the main things that come to my mind would be signage. Um, there, there is signage around in the town. I, I have seen a few signs with, uh, like, like the the tractor. It, you know, the tractor sign you see in a few areas. But I think I'd I wouldn't be opposed to more signage. Just urging people to just be safe. Watch out. Yeah, Karen. Um, so we're we're talking about you know a future. We're talking about the next you know seven, eight, nine years. However, there surely in that period of time, there's going to be tra traffic devices that could be employed to um, alleviate the danger that surrounds tractors on the highway. And in particular, I'm, I'm thinking of the intersection of Route 5 and 20 and Cooley Road, which is a significant issue for the tractors crossing Route 5 and 20. And Tim might have some, some other, there might be some other roads where they're already, um, there are already is an issue. And I have spoken up at town board meetings for years about that intersection at Cooley Road that it needs a traffic device of some sort. But surely within the next several years, there's going to be devices that could be employed to, to um, stop traffic if, it, if a tractor comes in and they can cross the road. Uh, and and I, I don't know what it is, but I do know that you know people much younger than me. I have these ideas on how they can handle these situations, and I think we should be open to um, employing something like that. And the the other thing is um, in in the list, you also have uh, alternative uh, means of transfer transportation, and even though you have miles of bike trails, etc. Uh, I'm thinking in terms of bike rental um, stations that they are now putting in uh, some of the some of the cities. Rochester, which is not really a large city, but uh, and and I've seen them, you know, I've seen them in state in the parks, and it's I don't see any reason at all why we couldn't look in and try to employ something like that, especially especially in the uptown area, which is going to be one of our up and coming areas. So that's it. And with that also, Karen, it's going to be the Al Auburn Trail, um, which would be, a, which is, a, you know, basically a bike and pedestrian trail. Um, and that would be really, um, I think, spectacular if we could have, that a, a bike rental something or other there in uptown where they could just get on the Auburn trail and just go for miles and miles and miles and you know um, so that's a good opportunity at, at uptown I think okay um, I added just as a measurable here a DT which is just annual average daily traffic so measuring traffic counts on roads is generally a good indicator. Um, and then I have those items that you put down there. Are there any other measurables that you guys see um, um, 
the co I don't know yeah. if we want to do it, but I mean, it's kind of specific, but with the completion of the Auburn Trail, our section of it be a measurable that we'd want to have on there? It could be a measurable, or but as much as it's sort of yes, no action. thing, it seems more like an action item. Mm -hmm. I also added the connections just so we show it connects to Owl House Park and Uptown. And yeah. And to Blue Heron. Right. Yeah. Uh, Kathy, did you have something you want to add? I did, and it's sort of still a thought in my head. I'm not. It's probably more of. Um, it's kind of between the two, but I think traffic safety studies and seeking grants are the same. Like uh, Genesee Transportation Council. I think you know our traffic in the town is starting to become an issue, or it has been an issue. <laughs> um, and so I think that goes in hand in hand. So, um, and, and as an action item, <clears throat> something which we're already doing, <clears throat> um, the Canandaigua Local Development Corp is working in concert with the city of Canandaigua on their ETC grant 332 intersection with 5 and 20 and making downtown more accessible to the lake, which I think benefits all of us. So um, perhaps as an action item, working in conjunction with the city of Canandaigua, kind of nebulous though. Let me think about that one a little bit more. <laughs> okay. Um, Bill, you've been quiet today. You got anything to add here for transportation? I just think one of the biggest keys is going to be, like you were saying, is about traffic patterns and just making sure that we're trying to address things before they become huge issues by looking at population of certain areas and what's anticipated to be a bigger area just to keep the flow going good and safe. Um, so let's see. I, as you all know, I'm always a big proponent of code review because I think a lot of that plays into uh, what we end up developing. Uh, I would like to see, I know we just recently did it, but the site design criteria, I think, uh, does tend to create larger streets, which uh, promote faster travel, and especially as we get into like our uptown area when we, or smaller neighborhoods, suburban areas, it's probably appropriate that they not be 12 feet wide. Um, and along the same lines of code review. Um, transportation and land use uh, do intersect quite um, in a strong fashion. So when we're talking about like the uptown area, one of the big things that they've, they've mentioned is, you know, bringing buildings closer to the street, uh, creating them in a pedestrian scale. So if we want to encourage um, alternative forms of transportation, whether it's biking, walking, uh, whatever, we have to look at our land use and zoning codes to do that. Um, so if there's no objection to that, I'll... No, that's, uh, that's, that's a very good idea. touched on and um, so 
transit users. Um, oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Working with RTS, Ontario County, and the City of Canandaigua um, to develop strategies. One of the big issues with uh, transit in our area is uh, the frequency that it comes by once every hour. Uh, doesn't really allow people to use it very often. The connectivity, you know, making it available in more places throughout our community, and then also the convenience. Um, one of the things I always harp on at the City of Canandaigua is creating a crosswalk to their West Avenue uh, hub there, you know, mm -hmm. making it easy for people to access uh, public transit. So uh, with that in mind, I would like to put in an action item to that effect. You know, that we're going to work with RTS, the county, city of Canada, and all partners to um, improve public transit, whatever it may be. And then are you talking specifically about a hub, like say in Uptown? Has that been part of the Uptown plan, is to have some kind of a transportation hub? You know, uh, where, you, where you could have buses, but you could also have your RV, uh, EV uh, docking stations there, you know, uh, kind of a hub thing. I don't know yeah. that there was like a calling out for a RTS hub in the area. I think that there's certainly a recognition that there's an opportunity for it. I mean, there's two, there's two stops or three stops already in the uptown area. Um, let's see, it would be the Liberty Apartments, um, Trolley Station, and Tops, uh, all in the uptown area, all stops for RTS. Um, so I think that it's probably maybe a good goal for us to have here, you know, explore the creation of a, a hub. Uh, Karen, I think that you've mentioned before maybe TOPS is like a park and ride. Um, yeah. So, you know, uh, an uptown hub for RTS. Yeah, there, there's a lot of opportunities for a hub, I think. Eric, um, yep. thinking about measurables for that, um, oh. maybe we could get ridership data for, yep. you know, the lines that go through the town um, and number of official bus stops or, or unofficial, I don't know. Um, <laughs> I know like trolley station or, or no, I think it was the Liberty Apartments put one in when they were built. Um, uh, I think another one too, and this is from a conversation with Bonnie, is that, you know, they appreciate during planning review for large developments if we, um, you know, refer it to them to try to get a hub set up, but they kind of want to be involved even earlier than that you know, on that pre-planning about where a stop may be, because sometimes when it's already developed in engineering concept, they can't really do anything. Um, so they, they want to be involved with the planning process. <clears throat> um, let's see. Do you guys have anything else that you want to add here for transportation, whether it's measurable. Eric, you didn't finish that one review site design criteria and zoning code to identify. Yeah, I want to finish oh. that one a minute. I don't want to okay. take up every time. Just like wanted you to make note of it. Yeah. Um, I, I have my own notes off to the side that I'm kind of looking for, looking at too. Um, one of the other things that I think might be a good um, good item, action item, is to uh, create like a best practices manual for uh, bike and pedestrian infrastructure or you know walkability. I think when the planning board is doing their review, there's certain things that can't be done just through zoning. You know, say like we need uh, however many feet lanes, mm -hmm. depending on the context that it's occurring in might change uh, how it's designed. And so having this best practices manual that allows you to kind of use that context to design it at the planning stage I think might be important and ease 
make it easier for the planning board and the zoning board um, when they're reviewing projects. Is that part of complete streets? Zero. Yeah, I think it was. Yep. Uh, yeah. I mean, do, don't we have that already? I mean, isn't don't we have complete streets information that was shared um, with the planning or with with you know a document on the town website or something regarding complete streets? Or am I thinking no? I don't. We have a policy, but it doesn't spell out the specifics. It just says that we need, I mean, because it changes based on every road or every part of the town you're looking at. So the policy doesn't say what you need to do to the street specifically, but it just says that every time we work on a road or a new one is built, that it'll be evaluated for what kinds of complete streets treatments could be used or put onto that road. But yeah, it's not specific. It doesn't plan it out in detail or anything. Yeah, I guess I'm thinking of that as being um, a flexible document. Whereas when you start getting into code and best practices, I mean, best practices, obviously. But I mean, um, you can't sometimes write code exactly the way the situation might develop in a community, especially when you're looking for a complete streets contribution to that to whatever the community is you know what i'm saying i think that the design criteria can come in if it's a little more robust for complete streets treatments um it could it could be used i mean it, it has stuff in there but it could be a little bit i mean there more it's kind of like form-based code you know how you know, you still have the code, but it's based on form and on what is happening in the moment with, you know, whatever you're trying to develop. I, I'm thinking the same thing about streets. Um, you may have a, a flexibility in the code so that we don't say, oh, just like you said, Eric, you can't, oh, it's 12 feet wide. Do we really want them that wide? Um, that kind of thing. I think that that's, that's probably our goal is to just provide the tools for the planning board ECV to yeah. uh, use user understanding of the context. Um, but we, I don't think that we have anything currently, especially with working with the planning board. We really, we really don't. And the site design criteria is pretty. It's pretty it's, cut and cleared. <laughs> it's pretty thin beyond like roads, like for cars, but for mm. pedestrians and bikes, it's not really there. Um, one other thing that is more probably to be added to this one, site design criteria and zoning code. Um, there's, an, there's a zoning concept or a planning concept called transit oriented development. So where you have transit service is probably more appropriate for denser development. Um, it saves the um, RTS in this and the cost of expanding lines, adding buses to reach more expanding areas. Um, you know where you have to, where you have the, that transit available, uh, you should kind of locate development there. So the uptown area is an obvious example, one that we've talked about in the past. But um, you know, MUO3 has some transit service to FLCC, as well as just across the border in the city of Canandaigua. And there's not any MUO1 or anywhere else in the town, except for uh, the hospital would be the only one that's just in the middle Cheshire quarter. So. Um, if there's no objection to that, I would like to add that here as well that um, make or promote, I guess, uh, greater uses um, and potentially higher density nearby existing transit service. So, Sounds good. Yeah. Okay, so next goal, infrastructure. Sarah, thank you for joining us. Bye, Sarah. Have a great night. Thank you. All right, infrastructure. So, this 
goal is going to require me to scroll. So, uh, our goal for infrastructure, provide public water and sewer services in areas of the town identified in town plans for continued residential, commercial, and industrial growth and limit their expansion in the areas of the town where increased growth is not encouraged. Promote the expansion of high-speed internet and affordable renewable energy options. Uh, plan for the replacement of aging infrastructure and for the future necessity of stormwater infrastructure. So, I guess, if we, let's break this down, I guess, and into a couple different pieces and see if that helps us kind of come up with any measurables. So the first one, uh, provide public water and sewer services in areas of the town identified in town plan. So this, you know, refers to the water master plan and the sewer master plan uh, for continued residential, commercial, and industrial growth limit their expansion in areas of the town where increased growth is not encouraged. Uh, generally, uh, where growth isn't encouraged is also not included in the town plans. You know, we didn't, we wanted sewer in, in Cheshire, but not necessarily, you know, down uh, County Road 16. Um, so that's kind of built into the plans. But, so let's, let's focus specifically first off on a measurable for um, achieving or accomplishing those town plans, the sewer master plan and the water master plan. Um, Are you talking about updates because we already have those? Yeah, we're not talking about updating them as part of this. Essentially, okay. but we, so goals, we have them already. Like, yeah, like their goals when we do this will likely be incorporated right into the comp plan because they were only done three years ago at yeah. this point. Right. Um, and I don't think there's nothing wrong with them. We'll likely incorporate them in here, the action steps. Yeah. But you know, as far as oh, measurables go, um, how might we measure our success, success in uh, achieving those goals as laid out in those plans? Uh, I guess my first suggestion would be the miles, feet of new sewer and water. Um, there are specific, uh, I don't, I guess they're, they're lists, I suppose, for both water and sewer, although sewer is a short list of places that they would want to extend it. And although we could just add, I guess, a I'll fix up the wording a little bit. But so this would be I think there's a recommendation for like a water line down dual road. When we're measuring our success here, we can say yes it was accomplished not. Same with Sewer in Cheshire, sewer in Grandview Park. I can't remember okay, so, what the third. So here, here's the other part of the sentence: increased growth that it, and and where uh, increased growth is not encouraged. I don't think you want personally water going down Dual Road. The it's too close to County Road 16 for one thing. So what I'm suggesting is is that there are places in the town where water might not be the best thing to do. Um, I get it. Uh, so, but, but, but we don't really, I, I, I can't, I don't know of any place that I've read in the, in the water master plan where there says, no, we don't want water here. Um, but because any, every time you encroach on them, I know that the farms need the water and that would be good for them. And what happens is we put a water line in and then we 
make sure that they have and that and we say okay so it's no laterals on this water line but you know town board issues laterals all the time on uh, you just take hickok road um we've got lots of development on that road and in the beginning it was not intended so water lines are an issue to development in farmland is what i guess i'm trying to say and so i, I don't, don't really feel clear that the town is really have compatible documents about saying that you know it, it's not going to happen or maybe it should happen um i i mentioned it a moment ago i just i not saying anything about whether or not you're right or the plan itself is right uh but the plan does say that well, this is the exist the future service area that's proposed, which is the entirety of the town of Canandaigua. Yeah. Um, yeah. And then, you know, that this is their improvements that they shown, and this is the one on dual road. So it is there and is in the plan. You know, if our if our action item is to um, achieve or you know uh, to complete this plan, then it includes those extensions. And yeah. if that's not what we want to do, then it would have they would necessitate an update of those plans. Is that what you want? Karen, we'll get to you in just a second. It's it's problematic. I, it's all I all I can say. Um, I understand the dichotomy that we have here between getting water to farmers and not making it also available to the lots that that will probably be sold off because the water line is there so it it's 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 an issue Does that uh, address kind of what you're getting anyways? I think it does. Thank you. Yeah, Karen? I, I like the way that's worded. I, I think that that, that that basically sums up a lot of the, the thoughts that I had about that. Okay. Thanks, Tim. Yeah, Karen? So the town has this thing about using water in places where they want to uh, not using not putting water in places where they want to discourage development but pretty much every place in the town has some sort of development there are there are houses there and I, i'll tell you i firmly believe that any if we're able to provide city water potable water to every house in the town of Canandaigua, we should be doing it. Now, I've, I have, we go to A's over in Cheshire a lot in this pandemic. Night after night after night, I am watching people hauling water from the, um, the tank that's on that side road there. But more than that, I am a firm believer that every citizen of the United States is is should have potable water and there are people within the town of Canandaigua who do not have potable water they have um, the um, sulfur water they have water that's not that some of them don't have water at all at certain times of the season um, I believe every US citizen should have potable water and I I just, I can't stress that enough. And I really would like to see that, that uh, little thing that says um, to li limit um, expansion um, out of there. I, I mean, I think the entire town should have water lines. Sewers, I understand. I do believe that the entire lakefront should, be, should have sewers. 
and that that's as far as I'll go with that. And Cheshire, we already know that there's an issue with the cost, but uh, I'm I'm telling you, water is a right. Everybody has a right to have potable water, and and in the United States of America, we should give potable water water lines to every citizen in the town. That's the end of my little speech here. Well, the one factor, having just had water installed, it is a very expensive, all right, $35,000 to have water to our property on County Road 32, uh, which we did not vote for, but we have anyway, over a 30 year period. There are people in our neighborhoods who can't afford that. So that is one of the, you know, um, issues that we have to talk about in this town. Water is not cheap anymore. I mean, it's a big expense. And I think that's going to be a situation, getting water to people because those people have to be able to afford it because they're buying it and they're developing their, their land to do that. If I can interrupt just real quickly, I, I can see both sides of the argument. I think probably both of you can see the other person's side as well, but I also don't think it's going to be finalized in this. I wanted to pull this up because when this language is taken from the 2011 comprehensive plan and was essentially not updated, um, given that this water master plan was essentially developed through this, um, this comprehensive plan as its guiding document, I don't know whether they kind of felt that water doesn't increase growth and you know whether they agree with Karen that uh, it should you know cover the entirety of the town. It seems like this planning document certainly agrees with you, Karen. Whether or not you know it will be added and accomplished or changed later on, let's save that for another day. I don't think we need to finalize that tonight. Um, okay. With that in mind, is there? Provide public water sewer services. Can you? Um, is there anything else that you guys want to touch on for just this first section? If there's not, I do want to add just the one thing that I mentioned before that we continue. Of water. And also, um, especially as it relates to sewer, uh, both Grandview, Cheshire, and probably anywhere, cost is prohibitive. I don't want to, 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 to take up too much more time on, on the topic, but um, I'm, I'm sure that you know, all, all of you are aware and uh, some of you have also have made these points earlier, but once you start running sewer and water everywhere, uh, typically what follows is it's so much easier now to develop land and uh, mm -hmm. that, that can have a big impact on the agricultural land in the town. I agree. Um, I'm trying to think of how I know that that is taken into account in the sewer master plan as far as where their priority areas came from. Um, I think this is their map. So this is their map along with should be proposed sewer areas, I think. Uh, they are in blue. And they did try to keep them out of areas that in the town were zoned for agriculture or rural. You know, Cheshire kind of exists out here just because, you know, it's Cheshire and it's got poor soils. And then the other ones are sort of um, connections to existing areas. This big one on Middle Cheshire Road. Uh, along with a couple other ones on Middle Cheshire Road. But for the most part, they're not proposing 
extending into farmland. Man, this isn't really farmland there. Well, but except on 28. County Route 28. This right here is in farmland, but it certainly brings it closer to farms. Yes, uh, I it think does. This, it's farmland over here. Yep. Um, and this is currently farmed, although it's owned by the Gineco family. Um, so I bring that up to say, oh, Gary, go ahead. Gary, you're muted. And now you're frozen. <laughs> uh, all right, well, Gary, I think will join us again in a minute. I hope that his computer unfreezes. But um, I bring that up to say, if if the goal of this comprehensive plan is to implement the uh, this sewer master plan that I'm showing you guys right here, do you think that that Tim accomplishes kind of what you want to do or want to prevent as far as not extending uh, sewer into farmland? or in areas that we want to preserve. I think uh, I'm unmuted now. Am I not, Eric? Yeah. You are, Gary. Uh, I mentioned to you that I was only going to, uh, you know, attend the meeting, not say anything, look, listen to other people's uh, thoughts uh, on this uh, subject, on these subjects. But on the sewer, we, we did, we uh, spent an extensive amount of time in regards to trying to save the farmland. Uh, the one place that was of a concern is going up Route 28 because they do have a lot of problems there. And uh, they were talking about going to Emerson Road. We kept it away from Emerson Road because you get up the Emerson Road, there's a lot of farmland there. And since the developers are able to pay a lot more for the farmland than the farmers are able to pay for it, uh, naturally, some of this is going to be uh, gone uh, shortly. So uh, I can, uh, you know, address the uh, sewer problems uh, or where they were going to go. And the main ones is like Eric said, is uh, Cheshire. And then on uh, the other one up Grandview and then up Route 28 were the main ones that we uh, tried to address because it was getting close to farmland on a couple of those items. And as far as water goes, you know, it, it's it's nice to have, for everybody to have water, but it's gonna cost for the town of Canandaigua, well, it would cost several millions of dollars to implement that, as Joyce indicated. And, uh, you know, it's nice to get the, the water lines out to people that, uh, you know, you can, you can help out. But if you notice, if you, I was amazed when I moved down here a little over 40 years ago because I lived in the northern part of the state. And uh, the water lines usually end at the city boundary. They don't go out into the country like they, they do down here in the uh, Finger Lakes area. So that's just my thoughts on it. Yeah. Um, Tim, to get back to you, uh, do you think that this appropriately protects like farm farmland areas, I guess, if this plan that's on the screen were accomplished? Um, I, I'd probably have to look at it for an extra second, but from what I can see here, I, I think like, generally speaking, it does. Um, another comment I could make is in recent years, I've, I've been, I've been happy with that, that a lot of people in the town are starting to, to recognize the importance of farmland, or I should say the, the people on this committee are, are definitely recognizing that, you know, we, development is good, but you, you got to keep in mind what the impact of development can do to, to agricultural land. Uh, so running water to people's properties, you know, can be a beneficial thing. Um, just, just you know, the the worry is is once you start running water everywhere, is how easy is it now for a developer to come in? Um, so, I su suppose you could either not run water to certain areas, um, but if you do end up running water to certain areas, I guess you could come back and have the town just have a even more firm stance about keeping the farmland protected where the water lines run through. Uh, but you know, there's, there's, there is still that, that thought, that worry that once you start running water through, um, you'd have to have a really firm stance about not having development in certain areas, which I suppose definitely can be done, especially with the, pro with the progress we've had with that in recent years with the town. But I guess just, that's just 
the thought that once you start running lines everywhere is now it becomes so much easy easier to develop things. But, but running but running city water to people's properties, I'm sure a lot a lot of people would would like. So I added this on here. Uh, hopefully you can see it now. That uh, just an action item to solicit comments from the Ag Advisory Committee before water and sewer infrastructure extensions. So that you know, if the town is proposing to extend water and sewer, that they would get comments from the farmers to see what the what the possible ag impacts of that would be. Similar to how we do with development, that uh, if a project comes in that impacts farmland, that uh, we refer it to the ag committee for comments. Mm -hmm. um, Gary, I'm curious if you have thoughts on that, being that you chair that committee or certainly on it. No. I'm, I'm just on the committee. Uh, that's a good uh, point to make there, really, in regards to that, just like uh, any developer, where any developer is going to go, where it goes, uh, if it's an ag land, then the ag committee also uh, puts her uh, thoughts process in and sends it through the different channels for the town. Um, I also want to add ECB, just because there are Protecting farmland is a matter of protecting, you know, land and the resource and land, same way with open space and environmental value. Thank you. Um, yep. Moving on on this one, uh, promoting the expansion of high-speed internet and affordable renewable energy options. Uh, both of these are kind of out of the town's purview, but we did add it as a comp plan team. Um, being that, if I recall, I think Karen, you might have, at least for the high-speed internet one, had been a big proponent of that. Uh, maybe you have some uh, measurables and action items that we can include here. Well, you certainly could um, measure the uh, um, the high speed internet, the internet uh, capability, the expansion of um, what do they call the lines? Fiber optic? Fiber optic, Fiber optic yeah. Thanks for getting the big words for me. Um, there is. There is a map that the FCC provides, let's say, that uh, these companies are supposed to report it to the FCC every year. Yeah. Uh, what, so this is the number of broadband providers, and this is the town of Canandaigua. Um, so generally there's two or three. But um, their download speeds are only 25. Yeah, I see that. It's pretty low, mm -hmm. essentially. Like uh, broadband is 25. High speed might be more like 100 or so. Yeah. Um, so there's not not a lot in the town of Canandaigua at that speed. Certainly in rural areas, but. 940, that must be fiber. Uh, and then, say, like Acoustis, again, 940. So, uh, as a brief detour from our measurables, we can uh, use the FCC reports for. For this location of availability of, I don't want to put fiber optic, but no. high speed yeah. uh, options, and I'll just put 100 megabits per second. Does that work? That works. As Tim will tell you from the Ag Committee, that was one of the main concerns uh, that they had is a lack of uh, internet service. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, 
I'm not, like I said, it, you know, it's certainly outside of the town's purview unless the town wants to pay to extend fiber optic lines, which I would venture is probably not not feasible at this point. Um, but as a goal, um, working with Ontario County and various providers to identify methods to proliferate high-speed options, it's relatively broad, but gives the town latitude to identify the appropriate methods. Um, let's see. There, if nobody else has anything there, because again, I don't think there's much that we can do. There's another part with renewable energy options. Um, well, um, as far as renewable energy options go, the city of Canandaigua is now uh, working with a renewable energy uh, consultant to bring, you know, a lower electric uh, costs to the city residents. I'm wondering if we couldn't, if the town of Canada we couldn't partner, part of the program we couldn't take part in, uh, but as far as the efficiencies of the government, of, of their, you know, government operations. <laughs> but I'm wondering if the town of Canandaigua couldn't cooperate with the city of Canandaigua to be able to buy, you know, you have a buy-in by your uh, resident and you buy electric at a lower rate and it's all renewable. Oh, it would be all renewable. Talking about, community, talking about community choice aggregation? Yes, yes, yes. And so the city's already on it. And actually I spoke with the, the uh, consultant that they're using, the, the company, and I said, well, what about if the town of Canandaigua could, you know, be a partner? And she said, well, we're not there yet. They're just working on the efficiencies part of their own operation. But, you know, maybe we could partner with the city of Canandaigua to bring low cost renewable energy to the residents of town, of the town too. Um, there is another one that the town, the town, I think um, express this in, intent to be a climate smart community, and then there was there was some grants available for it, uh, but I'm not sure how much else was done. You know, doing I can't remember what there's like a number of items. Like I think you have to do four out of eight or nine before you're considered a climate smart community. Um, we could you know make it an action item here that the town become <laughs> yeah all right love that one oh yeah um is there anything else for renewable energy options, promoting the expansion of renewable energy options. Um, plan for the replacement of aging infrastructure and for the future necessity of stormwater infrastructure. Um, so, with regard to planning for the um, I w was thinking that maybe when the town accepts dedication um, of, or even, I guess, even during the planning process before they're at the process of accepting it, maybe an evaluation of the cost of future replacement um, so that, you know, the town accepts that they have an understanding that they're taking on such a cost in the future. Does that make sense? Is that appropriate? Yeah. I do have a comment about the stormwater infrastructure and how yep. trees play an important part in stormwater management. And I, 
I know that we talk about this and, you know, we review it and everything, but I, I still think there's an emphasis that has to be made in our, with our residents with the trees and how trees are so important in our watershed. And I don't know if our residents really know that about their trees, that every time they cut down a tree, they, you know, they impact our stormwater infrastructure. I, I don't know, maybe, a, you know, an action step is to, you know, educate basically more than the ECB has been able to do, I'm sure, um, about the, 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 you know, necessity of trees in stormwater management. Good. Thank you. Um, I also, again, another code review thing, uh, evaluating the impact of local regulations on infrastructure costs and efficiency. Um, this partly comes from uh, stormwater stuff, as you make lots bigger, protecting stormwater becomes more difficult. Same with you know, as development kind of sprawls out. Um, and also sewer and water, if there's less people paying on them, less, uh, I can't remember what the term was, but EDs, I think it was, EDUs, um, they become more expensive per linear foot. Hmm. I guess in the end, the uh, there might be under our operations, like town operations, just a larger goal of evaluating the impact of existing regulations. Um, and I know that uh, Chuck, although he's not available to be here tonight, did want to um, do like a stormwater master plan. Mm -hmm. Which would uh, identify, well, similar to what they have, identify areas that have already been, you know, flooding or a risk of flooding and then plan for potential improvements of that system. So are you talking about stormwater at in all the town or just in the watershed? Because he just, uh, they're just working, his, his, mat, his stormwater review is just for the watershed. Isn't that right? I don't think so. I think that's where most of the issues come up or have come up. I, I think that, but, I think it is just in the watershed, but anyway, I, I could be wrong. I don't know. I think that he would probably, I obviously can't speak for Chuck, but I think he, might see it as the town at large. Okay. Okay. Um, that's it that I have. Okay. If we're ready, go on to goal 10 operations. So uh, this goal generally relates to government operations and also covers a bit of the school district. Uh, collaborate with the city of Canandaigua school districts and other, other neighboring municipalities in a delivery of services. Uh, coordinate planning efforts with other, other municipalities and agencies as appropriate and ensure effective communication, conversation, <clears throat> and transparency with all interested stakeholders. Um, what, what do we see as measurables to this? Say if we're like, can we, we're, yeah, go ahead. 
can we please identify what the services are that that are being delivered? What what are we talking about? We're talking about roads, or are we talking about what kind of services? Um, I don't know, snow plowing. Um, what would the city of Canada or what would the town of Canandaigua uh, give to the city of Canandaigua or the school districts? I'm mean, talking about what kind of services? Yep. Uh, potentially plowing. Uh, obviously, when I think it was this last winter, maybe the town uh, helped plow Eastern Boulevard, I think is what it was. Um, potentially parks. Uh, you know, we have a existing parks program that's shared. You know, there's certainly resources shared. Um, one of the things that I saw in review of other municipal master plans, like Bloomfield, was um, history. Like, um, and I thought that maybe the we could work together to form like a more regional history and have more historic events that might draw a larger in interest than just um, a specific locale or a specific area. It, it's pretty broad and all-encompassing. Um, even like sewer, like the town has a couple areas that they might want sewer, and you know, oh, you mean like, want to create <laughs> like Grandview? <laughs> yeah, maybe, or, or even Cheshire when we were looking at that. Like Grandview obviously makes some sense because it's similar to or right next to the city of Canandaigua, but you know, if the town if the town created its like own sewer district, and the county is pretty fickle about what they accept, the town would have to hire a uh, somebody licensed to to work like the sewer district. So whether we farm that out to Ontario County, which we have been doing, or maybe we partner with the city of Canandaigua, that is something of a shared service, right? you guys have any understanding that, you know, the service that we provide is, again, relatively broad, maybe it's even the transfer station. How might we measure success or? Well, number of people who come to the transfer station who use it, uh, you know, like the city of Canandaigua. We, I don't know if we keep numbers now or not. We probably keep tonnage is what we do. We record yeah, the yeah. tonnage. Uh, so. That would be one way to know how many people in the city of Canada were, are participating. One of the, one of the other ways is if with the highway department using a um, a code for for their labor hours for when the when that overlaps into the county or the um, city. For example, um, if if the town plows some city streets or the town plows uh, county road 16 things like that um you can you can measure the the hours spent and the and the um, how much actually the shared service is either saving us or costing us etc and i i know there's ways of doing that the other service that's shared is fire service and uh the fire departments actually do a good job of evaluating and measuring. We could use those reports for one thing. Um, and and the parks departments actually keep pretty good records too. And Sarah's not here to confirm that, but Samantha and Sarah both know that um, X number of hours are, are relegated to city, city using the town parks and the town using city parks for children's groups and summer services, et cetera. So we have, we have all sorts of ways of, of doing it by measuring the number of, of work hours that, that go into the shared service part. Maybe, maybe just having a, um, an item number that just is shared service. It doesn't have to be one or the other. Depends on how, much, how, how well you want to track it. The thing I'd like to see happen, Karen, is when you and I uh, moved out here, the uh, people in the town could use the city of Kershaw Park 
and they could use our parks. Mm -hmm. And uh, that kind of went away. It didn't cost us any more than it did the city residents at the time. And uh, I'd like to see that uh, come back again where we're sharing them equally. We did have a program last year, the year before, but the uh, town residents uh, used the Kershaw much more than Kershaw or the city people used uh, Ananda or Butler. Oops. Okay. Um. Do you think that there? One of the things that I saw was a lot of, a lot of communities talked about park service as an opportunity for sharing. Mm -hmm. Do you think that Ontario County could have a coordinating role in that? I think somebody could have a coordinating role in it. It it, it seems to me it is is really, um, it's basically stupid, to have five or six or different lawn services mow for example mowing and maintaining the parks uh it it seems to me a community wide and we're the community of canandaigua that includes the town and city it seems to me that they that they could probably save some money by having a community wide service that um, does like one half and another one that does the other half rather than going from Blue Heron Park down to Onanda Park down to this place and that place, Miller Park. Um, you know, have it by territory and unfortunately the city is right in the middle of the territory so you have, have all this broken up um, maintenance type things that, I, that happen. And you know, the, a good move was letting the town residents use our transfer station that's one area that they have to go to um use that model in in determining where the roads are plowed who plows which side of the town um the, the fire departments do that they have an area that they service through the the different areas we should do that in in other departments in the town and the city that you can do that with. And, and it seems to me parks and recreation is one area where that can be done. You guys see anything else? Um, I, I'll have to check back with our notes. I, I just feel like there's something that we're missing here. Um, Oh, uh, for an action item, and I think that this is something that we maybe have talked about at a previous meeting. Um, one of our, we have all these measurables. Uh, all these measurables relate to data and using data. Uh, an action mm -hmm. item for the baselines. Um, yeah. Yeah. Not so much. Not so much getting the baselines, although that mm -hmm. will be part of this, but just better management of data, making sure that it's easily accessible and digestible um, so that when we go looking for it, it is there. I mean, the world survives at this point on data and mass <laughs> data largely. We get better answers through using data. So creating sort of a data management program will help us at the town be able to work more effectively. much service other than you know the school which every town resident benefits from uh, coordinate planning efforts with other municipalities and agencies as appropriate I think that the town does a fairly good job of this yeah, and so we have too. asked as far as um, 
making sure that stakeholders are aware of different developments and planning mm -hmm. opportunities and whatnot. Um, so just on that or in that vein, we'll just say continue referring and utilizing. And then I'll I'll fill that one in later on. Uh, sure, effective communication, conversation, and transparency with all interested stakeholders. Um, okay, I know what this. We have this. Uh, we want to make sure that it's that the town is essentially participatory. You know, in this planning process. We have a number of stakeholders, you guys, who have come to a lot of meetings and, and have provided a lot of input to improve our process in planning and then also decision making at, say, the planning board, town board level. It's beneficial to have more input from town residents. So, how do we, um, how do we do that? What action steps do we need to do to make sure that? People feel like they can speak up, uh, feel like they're heard when they speak up, and uh, if somebody wants to observe and see what goes on, uh, they can easily do that. It's transparent, essentially, is what that gets at. You know, how can the town improve to those ends? Anything? Are we perfect? Absolutely. <laughs> I think uh, just a, uh, like a review, it, it, you know, it's kind of just like what the ECB di just did for our web page. We just went through and we just reorganized everything and found out which wasn't appropriate anymore and what new stuff was coming on. It's like, you know, you have to review it occasionally um, you know, either through committee or board or something to see where you've been and what you're doing. So you have to do that periodically to see if you can do it better. I, I don't know if that's a action item for every committee and then your result will be, you know, if people get more involved, I guess. Well, I'll just leave it at that. Update the town's website to make more user friendly. Uh, yeah. This might also relate to putting it on like a better mobile format, which people use more of now. Mm -hmm. uh, but just with that in mind, that people can use it more easily. Karen, did you want to add something? Well, you know, I, I actually think the town of Canandaigua does a really good job of providing information. And there's that expression, you can lead a horse to water, but, um, and I, th I th believe that's where we are. However, I'll, I'll go to the website and, you know, I spent a lot of time on the computer and I find the town website difficult to navigate difficult to navigate and it, it seems to me I you know I'm no website designer but it there are some steps that could be taken to make it easier to navigate but as a whole I mean we have a town newsletter uh, you know just going to the town dump on Sunday you find out stuff that you would never hear in a million years and <laughs> you, know, you laugh Steve <laughs> you've been there I see um, <laughs> It, I think, I think there is, the leaders of the town are accessible. People don't realize how accessible they are. Um, you know, I, I can, I can text Jim Fletcher and I get an answer within five minutes usually. Um, where can, where else can you find that? It's, residents don't take the time to, to look for what's right there in front of them. And I honestly don't see any way of getting any more information to them 
uh, than we're already doing. They put the things on Facebook. I'm sure they put it on Instagram also. So they're using social media. They're use, using the internet. Um, there's brochures. There's the, the dump. Um, there, there's there's our our representatives who are usually out and about and around and are approachable except for gary davis oh did i say that <laughs> <laughs> anyway um i think we do a good job i th i think the the burden right now the onus is on the other half the people that don't partake and don't look for information <laughs> Um, <laughs> you guys might like this. <laughs> what if? Had... How are you going to get anything done? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I wonder. I, I put that up kind of a joke, but also because we do have a lot of committees, we is it do. difficult for residents to follow and navigate? even through the website, knowing like, you know, I'm looking for such and such information. Is it on the history team, the history page? You know, where is it when a number of different groups might be working on the same thing or similar things anyways? Mm -hmm. uh, might be difficult to navigate for residents having a number of different communities and might be diff difficult to participate if um, you feel like you're getting stretched too thin. I also just put in here as well, streamline communications with residents uh, and utilize existing groups. So if you have HOAs, you got CCAT and Cheshire, uh, you got the watershed, um, those groups exist with a, no, a more narrow purpose in mind, but they may be willing to uh, share with people as well. They are probably also the groups that are on the town's MailChimp newsletter already. They're active members of the town. But you know how trying to duplicate communication efforts to a certain degree and reach more people. Um, that's kind of all I have on this one. And if we have a couple minutes, which we do, let's try to finish this out strong. We have one last goal that we were asked to um, make it or isolate it, make it its own. Tourism. Um, so our goal. It's very easy, one sentence. Focus on contributing to and supporting the local and regional tourism industry. So, uh, with that in mind, what do you see as a measurable for that? How will we measure the tourism industry? Well, I would imagine that the visitor's uh, connection keeps numbers. Um, as far as tourism goes, I think we have to identify what our tourism hotspots would be in the town of Canandaigua. And maybe the, the, the visitor's connection can, uh, because they handle so much of what's unique to the town of Canandaigua in their literature, they must have some kind of a, you know, document that data that says who's coming and and what are they looking at or something? Um, so I guess that would help us understand tourism in our community. Um, what do we have right now in your guys' eyes that people come here for? And I, I say that to uh, try to identify potential actions, what do we have, how do we improve on them. One thing that we don't have but neighboring communities have is breweries. I think there's only Star Cider in the town of Canandaigua. Um, but breweries are a big tourist item. We have the brew tour. Uh, there are a couple wineries in the town, but how do you take advantage of the tourism for alcohol? Um, What 
do you guys have? We have Blake and C-Mac. Well, we have our historic tours. Um, you know, there's a there's a walking tour of Cheshire now that the history team put together. And here's one of the things that they've done. They've done um, a walking tour on an app so that you can walk around Cheshire, you know, and you can look at a building, you know, whatever, at whatever address and, and get its history, its previous photos of it and those kinds of things. So yeah, I, the tourism apps might be something that we should look into when we're thinking about like the trails, like our bike trails, I'm thinking, and especially, or other trails, walk, you know, hiking trails. Um, I think we have it in some form, but I'm not quite so sure, so. Yeah. Um, the, oh, go ahead, Karen. It'd be interesting to know um, what the uh, tourism, uh, Finger Lakes, whatever they call it, uh, tourism group has. So if they have a brochure that has all the hiking trails or one that has a brewery tour, because there's several breweries within the town of Canandaigua and city of Canandaigua, um, wine, wine tasting tours, um, just exactly what Joyce said, but I don't know what they have. And yeah. it'd be interesting to have that information and perhaps update it. Uh, well, certainly update it because I'm I'm be surprised if they have like Star Cider on there because it's so, so relatively new or um, some I'll of the new you. ones within the city. I mean, there's a there's a new one now going to open in the city and uh, peace peace make peacemaker whatever it was that's yeah. reopened over on um, the side street. You know, I guess it all depends if you're talking about digital uh, information or if you're talking about printed. Um, you know, well, digital, <laughs> that's easily updated and upgraded, you know, instantaneously, but printed information is a little bit different. And I, I don't know, I guess my question really is, how much are brochures, a printed brochure, actually a value nowadays to tourism? You know, because we used to have these big brochure exchanges and every, you know, and that's what the tourism, uh, you know, Ontario, what we used to do in Ontario County. And, but I, I, but, and you see these little kiosks, you know, at various places, you know, like at the gas stations or other various, mm -hmm. and even at our own um, uh, town hall, uh, we have all these printed information, but you know, how much do they, how much use do they get opposed to the digital? I would imagine less so and less and less. Yes. So uh, I guess it's asking, you know, I guess knowing that fact would be guide us in the direction of should we be doing more tours like the history tour in Cheshire, which is on an app or, you know, and our bike tours, should we be making a brochure or should we be making a website, you know, a separate, you know, some, something digital anyway. That's just another question um, in, in collaboration with the with the visitors connection. I'm looking at their website now. One of the things I recall Ryan saying is that he wanted to make Canandaigua a four season tourism destination. Yeah. Um, well, that's what the Finger Lakes connection does. <laughs> they got the whole, the whole thing there. Maybe we just have to interact with them more because, you know, they've got the infrastructure there about developing what we think are hot spots or interesting spots or opportunities in our town. I'm sure they, ha I just have a feeling they've got that all together, but maybe they don't. Uh, I added this, I think we may have touched on this on like the cultural part earlier, but I wanted to put it here because I thought it was a good piece of tourism as well. Cultural events like arts and music festivals, the arts fest, draws in plenty of people in downtown Canandaigua. 
um, something like that might be might be valuable where we can support it. Uh, you know, one thing what we might want to try is, is um, to have a, um, a Parks and Trails app in the on the town of Canandaigua website because I, I just looked on the tourism uh, and they they do have uh, they do tell you to go to Grimes Glen uh, every every place but uh, Ona uh, Upper Onanda Park which has a beautiful walking trail and waterfalls um, you know if we had an intern coming yeah. To work again uh, in the town that might be uh, you know some of these interns are really good at putting together an app and it, it would be kind of a test thing to see if 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 it would work number one if it would be used um, and number two it would be if it does work we could we could have have one for the breweries we could have one for the uh, area wineries for um, the, the actual parks, things to do in the parks and stuff like that. Um, what, uh, what, I'm try, what I'm trying to say is let's look for new ways to encourage people to use um, our um, natural resources for tourism. I put on there, create an app for using an existing app. I don't know if we can say to them, Hey, we have these things. Can you include those as well? Uh, we don't want to reinvent the wheel. And if they have existing traffic, and you know, they somebody searches Finger Lakes, what to do? If they're the first one that pops up, it might be best to just work with them than try to gain our own traffic online. Um, well, maybe we need both. I mean, sure, certainly they have um, the you know the individuals coming from out of town who probably are going to do exactly what you said they're going to contact the visitor center first but you know we have our own residents who probably are waking up on you know on a weekend and saying gee what are we going to do today um, and so we could have those apps available too on our website or somewhere so it's not yeah. just the visitor center making sure that we have our own access not only the visitors connection have it and if, I, if you uh, just Google um, Canandaigua tourism, you have to go halfway down the page before you find Finger Lakes, uh, whatever it's called, Finger Lakes Vis tourism. Visitors, con visitors, visitors con visitor connection. connection. Um, where if we had a uh, Canandaigua, um, a Canandaigua parks map or a Canandaigua trails map, it probably would show up higher because of the, of the, it actually has the name of what people are Googling in it, where Finger Lakes Tourism Connection does not have that in there. So if you're in Canandaigua, well, you're looking for Canandaigua, yeah. you're looking for things to do in Canandaigua, you know? Yeah. yeah. Um, we should, I, I get the impression though that we should probably work with, with them if they I assume that they know more about tourism than us here, we should probably work with them. Yeah. And then I'll Don't know, assume anything. Uh, the city of Canandaigua and uh, the, sorry, the Bellman Corporation um, on some of these things, which I have on here. We do have a map too. Karen, you probably know that. We have the map from the mm -hmm. Parks and Rec Master that. Plan. I do know that, yeah. Um, it's not really plastered around and but um is there anything else that you guys want to touch on before we leave? Tim, you got anything else to add for these goals or anything else? Uh, I I I think I'm I think I'm all right at the moment. I, I will say that I think a lot of great points were mentioned tonight and a lot of, a lot of good things were talked about. It's cool. good to be involved with the team again. We're glad to have you back. Good to have you. Steve, you got anything to add? Uh, nothing, nothing else. Okay. Bill, do you want anything else before we, we end the meeting tonight? Unless you think working with the Chamber of Commerce may help a little bit. 
Yeah, it's a good idea. Tourism. Okay. Karen, anything else? No, I've said enough. <laughs> Joyce, Gary, you got anything else? Thank you all. Gary, we'll see you guys watching. next time. All right. Uh, yeah, plan on the next, well, the next first Tuesday. Should be September 1st. So we got a short month to work with. Um, we're going to essentially start finalizing everything and trying to solicit more comments from the public on what would be a final draft. Um, and I will try to get that to everybody as soon as I possibly can. Okay. All right. Okay. Cool. Thank you guys for joining. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Good night, Good night, everyone. Good night, all. Good night. Good night. Good night.